beautiful name of Jesus. for a price we are long no, we are no, we are no longer our own we are hid in Christ bought for a price no longer our own father you say those who have not the Holy Spirit are none of yours but those who do father God we are yours and it's forever it's eternal redemption eternal life it's an eternal inheritance it is eternal it's forever and we're not going to listen to those lies that tell us that we can lose anything you found us we didn't find you you chose us we didn't choose you you're the seeker you're the lover we can only love others the way you love us you're the lover we only love you because you first loved us we are recipients and we come to receive we don't we don't come to give we come to receive we don't come to be rescued. We come to be resurrected. This is where we stand. We're standing on a sure foundation. And we are anchored. Our faith is anchored in you, Lord. We're not going anywhere. Your word says that you will not lose none of those the Father has given you. So we're not worried about losing our salvation. Because we know you won't lose us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I pray an anointing on this message, Father God. Lord, I believe your spirit is leading me here, Father God, where I'm going to go today. And Father, I, I, I trust that you're going to take up where I, where, 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 where I start. You take it from there, Father God. I'm giving it to you. This is your class. We are your children. And you are our Father. Amen and amen. 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 Woohoo! Good stuff. Amen.
Had problems with the door, trying to keep it open. Okay. But praise the Lord, let's get serious. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Let's get in the Word. Let's get in the Word. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, what I want to talk about today, okay, blessings upon this class. Okay, you ready? Yeah. What I want to talk about is, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what I love to teach on in this class, you know, what I love what pastors said I mean, uh, Elder, Elder Keith Richardson. Keith. He said two things that are pretty foundational. One of the things that he said up there is that 80% of the church is still leaving, living with a legalistic mindset. Okay? Kind of like this idea that we have to confess. What, what he's saying is that, okay, our works, our behavior, our attitude, okay, uh, some of the, our weaknesses does not have anything to do with our justification. Now, our, our behavior, our attitude does matter, okay? But it has nothing to do with our salvation. It has nothing to do with how God is receiving you, accepting you, forgiving you. Our behavior does not affect that because that's what salvation is. You're forgiven. You're saved. Yeah. Right? That's what salvation is. Otherwise, what, would so, yeah. it be, what behavior would it be that would negate your salvation if, if we're all guilty of something? Right. See, yeah. did you hear what he just said? He said, we're all guilty of something. Yeah. And people say, well, what about the homosexuals? What about this? What about that? What about that? Well, James said, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. Yeah. So we're all just guilty. Yeah, we're just guilty. So are we saved or not? Because Jesus saves the guilty. The Bible says he justifies the ungodly. That means he's declaring the guilty not guilty. Right. That's what justification is. So he's just, if he's justifying the ungodly, that means he's declaring guilty people not guilty. And he says, if you can believe that, then he'll take that faith and give you righteousness, his righteousness, perfect, uncorruptible righteousness of God for your faith. So, and that's what we live from. We live from that. So that's what we're going to look at today. We want to never, never, never put the root before, uh, put the fruit before the root. Like I always get it wrong, or Dylan always corrects me. You don't want to put the cart. You don't want to put the cart before the horse. Yeah. Okay. You got a cart. The horse is leading the cart. Mm -hmm. What we tend to do is put the horse before the cart. That's what okay. we want to do. The horse. We that's want the horse that's like putting. You got the root, and you got the fruit of the spirit. The fruit is Jesus Christ. We we're supposed to be branches connected to the vine. Jesus is the root. Okay, and we are branches connected to the root, connected to the branch. Right. Okay, That's what we foundation. tend to do is we put this fruit of the Spirit, our goodness, our self-control. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Self-control, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, right? The love, the mm. peace, all that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we tend to take that and put that before the root. Don't ever put the fruit before the root. The root comes from your relationship to Jesus Christ. That's how it's going to come. So you need to get plugged into your relationship with Jesus. Okay, locked into that place. That's the firm foundation. That's the firm foundation. We've got to be on a firm well, like foundation. Like I prayed. Yeah. We're on a solid foundation. Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation except that was already laid. And in the context of when he said that, that, there, that Jesus is a sure foundation, he even says, that, be careful what you build that you're on this, on this foundation with, what materials you use. He says, because whatever materials you use, some will be burned up, some will be good. You know, some, some, some of the things you yeah. do then go with you, some things aren't. That's basically what he's saying. Some is going to go with you, but some isn't even going to do any good in heaven. It's not going to go with you. So be right. careful what you're building on. Because some of the stuff you're putting all your focus on and what you're doing and thinking about and all that stuff. It, you, you, if you're all about football and baseball, that ain't, that ain't a, uh, that's not going to go with you to heaven. You're all about putting muscle on and looking like a big muscle man. Who I'm spending my whole life being a bodybuilder. Is that going to go with you to heaven? 
Right, right. No, it's not. It's the flesh, yeah. So make sure what you're building with is some spiritual material, some things that have the, the heaven. Like he says, keep your thoughts in heaven. He says, your mind, so he says, keep your treasures in heaven. We got to be heavenly minded, thinking about what's going to go with me. What's the good stuff? What is, what is it that pleases God? What is God? Yeah, yeah what it's is like, It's like with body exercise, property is some, a, a bit, somewhat, but spiritual exercise is profitable in all things. It's profitable for here and heaven. Yeah, spiritual right? Exercise, yeah. When he's talking, that's a good point because yeah. he even mentions that. He says about exercise. bodybuilding. He says, yeah, yeah you build the body. Yeah. That, he says that, you know, build, it'll help you in this life. But yeah, it'll, really. it'll, building your body, you know, that's helpful in this life, but, but, but you want to build exercise, spiritual yeah. exercise that is good here, not only here, but there too. Yeah, both places. Both, both places. Spirit, yeah. That's a good yeah. point. And we should look yeah. at that scripture because that's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good because he talks about that. Do you find that, Dylan? Okay. That's a good scripture because it point, proves my point. Yeah. And that's what he's talking about, material we carefully use. But he says something very telling in 1 Corinthians. He says that, okay, we're, we're a sure foundation in Jesus Christ. That's what you're building on. He's saying that to Corinth, the Corinthians. They're, they're on a sure foundation. Jesus, Jesus started that church in Corinth. Okay, so he knows what foundation they're building on. And it's a sure foundation. But then he's correcting them about things that are going wrong in the church of Corinth. And he tells them very clearly, he says, listen, be careful, you guys, okay, because you're messing up here. Okay, but be careful what materials you're using, because some of that stuff you're doing, it's good to be burned up. It's going to be useless in heaven. So be careful, and some of it's going to go with you. So he, said, he compares it to straw and hay, wood and, you know, stubble, things that burn up, as, as opposed to rubies, gold, silver, things that don't burn up. So he's comparing the materials you use with kind of materials to let you get a picture of some stuff gets burned up and others don't. So he said he's comparing your attitude, your behavior, your, your, the things you're doing in this life. That's doing you no good in heaven. But he says something we're telling there. He says, you're going to be tested with fire and, and, and those things that aren't good, there's going to be materials that you use are going to be burned up. But he says, you'll be saved. But like somebody jumping through a flame. See, right there, he's saying that your salvation is secure. You're going to go to heaven. You'll be saved. But it's going to be like jumping through a flame. It's because there's going to be some burning taking place, right, of stuff that's not going to do you any good there. So he's basically saying we want to be heavenly minded, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, and to be truly heavenly minded, we need to start with the root. Okay, because he says that's where the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes from. Dylan, if you can't find it, it's okay. Don't okay. worry, I don't just don't 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 worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's okay. It's First Timothy four eight. How does it say it? For bodily exercise profits <laughs> little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. See, see that? That's, that's exactly the point I'm making. Is that you could work all your life building muscle, but that's gonna it's not gonna do you any good there. Right? That's yeah. exactly my point. Right, right, right. That's scripture. Yeah. I'm just putting it into Henry, a little Henry can't do paraphrase. Right. Henry can't do paraphrase. You know, he don't mention building muscle. He, don't, he just says, but bodily exercise, that's bodily, yeah. that's bodily training. exercise. Bodily training. Right? Yeah. He don't say building muscle, going to the gym and building muscle, and whoo, -hoo, look at me. Woo, these people spend their whole life on that just to be buff and have all that muscle and look good and to go to show, go on shows and show off their muscle. But the Bible says, you know what the Bible says about that, showing off your muscle? It says, if you must boast, well, yeah. Don't boast in your, in your wisdom, in your knowledge, or your strength. Your riches. Yeah, your, yeah, your riches, your knowledge, or your strength. Your, wis your riches, your wisdom, or your strength. Three yeah. things. Don't boast of your riches, your knowledge, or your strength. He says, if you must boast, boast in the fact that you know and understand me. Amen. Okay? And that's what I like to boast on. I know God. I, I do. I don't know him perfectly. I know him well enough to know he ain't holding my sin against me. Amen. I know him well enough to know he saved me to the uttermost and he's now interceding on my behalf. I know him well enough that he's been merciful to my unrighteousness. I know him well enough to know he's my daddy and I want to be like dad. Okay? I know him well enough to know he's not my enemy. That I know who it is. The devil's my enemy. God isn't. He's my friend. The Bible says, God before you, who could be against me? He's my buddy. I've been reconciled unto God. I know him well enough to know that. Amen. Yeah. I've been reconciled. I know him well enough to know that I have peace with God because I've been justified by faith. Romans 5.1. I know him well enough to know all that. That's pretty good. I know him well enough to know he's, he's a father like the prodigal son. When he came home, the father didn't even mention his sin. The, the, when the son came home, he didn't mention his sin. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't angry at him. I, so I know him well enough to know he's not mad at me. Huh, wow. That's pretty good. I know him well yeah. enough that he ain't mentioned my sin. He didn't with the prodigal son. He's I know him well. I know him well enough that he he he's, he's wants fellowship with me, the sinner. 
People say he won't fellowship with a sinner. Look at the prodigal son. That father ran to that boy before he ever confessed anything. And he defended, so I, yeah. and he defended him against the brother. So I know him well enough that he is interceding for me. He does defend me. He's my defender. <sighs> Bam. The Bible even says, if you sin, I write this so you don't sin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, I write this so you don't sin. Now, I'm never encouraging sin. He says, I write this so you don't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate. He's interceding for you. He's defending you. He's got your back. That's the if God be for you, who can be against you? God will never leave you nor forsake you. That I know him well enough to know that. You know that he's not imputing our sins against us. Who? He's given us the ministry of reconciliation, and he's not imputing our sins, our transgressions, or trespasses against us. He's not imputing them. He's not imputing them. I know well enough, like David testified to that. He said, blessed, blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute your sins. David knew that, and he was living under the law. He understood something of grace, a graceful God, a God who is gracious and merciful. Because he knew that God knew his heart. Yeah. He knew well enough to know God knows my heart. He knows I feel bad about what I did. He knows that he he knows he knows that I, I'm still looking to him for answers. I'm still looking for him as my guide. I'm still looking to him, even though I got off bat off to his base a little bit. He knew enough to understand even that under the law. How much more should we understand that after great under after the cross, under living grace. under grace? Yeah. How much more should we get what David got? Right. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's look at some things. Okay. Let's look at this. What does it mean to don't put the fruit before the root? What does it mean? Romans, uh, John 8, 11. John 8, 11. Let's look at some scriptures. I'm going to show you because I'm going to show you a scripture. Okay, what, what, we, what we're, we got to understand. This is the key thing. We got to know what we're getting first. What comes first? Okay, right? Right, right. Romans 8, 11. Uh, John 8, 11. Sorry. What we read? Well, I don't want to read the... Okay, yeah. Uh, let me see. Let me find it. Okay, John 8, 11. Okay. Um, are, you're familiar with this story. I don't want to go through the whole story, but gee, these people wanted to stone the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? They wanted to stone her. Right. They interrupted Jesus' little sermon. They said, this woman's caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? You know, the law says to stone her. What do you say? Okay, are you going to go with this grace you've been giving people? Are you going to go with what the law says? You know, what, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Right? And Jesus did something right on the ground who made everybody leave. Eventually he stood up and he said, which one of you can cast the first stone? Who, who has no sin? And none of them can say they're perfectly keeping the law, right. you know. So apparently he wrote something in the sand to expose them right, right. and made them leave. Yeah. Okay, that's what I see, right? So, because it says he wrote on the ground twice. There's a reason it mentions that. He, he wrote something, Right. Some people say he was due. I heard, listened to somebody the other day. He was giving. A, he was expounding on this on this story, and he said he thinks he was just doodling. I'm like, Come I on. don't think so. Uh, you know, I don't think he was just doodling. Why else would it say it? Mention it twice. Yeah. If he was just doodling, ah, no, I think he was doing something. Yeah. Okay. I think he was exposing their junk, one at a time, because it says they left from the oldest to the youngest. There's a reason it says that too. Yeah. Because he and was exposed, by yeah. yeah. Hey, I think he started with the leaders. He didn't have to go through all of them, just one or two of them. You know, the leaders right, right. leave. Once they leave, well, then the rest are going to leave. He made them leave. Something he did in the sand, in the dirt made them leave. He's, okay? Yeah, he's not just playing but, in but, the sandbox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then he's left alone with the woman. Okay? And it says, verse 10, uh, I'm going to read it, Carlos, because um, I wanted to pick it up over here. It won't hear you. Okay. She said... Okay, so Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He says to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Okay, he's talking about condemnation, right? How many know the Bible in the New Covenant says there is no condemnation for you in Christ? None. Okay, so that's what we get. What he's doing for this woman is what we get. Fair? Yes. The only difference is he didn't go to the cross yet. He's kind of giving an advanced payment on what he's, you're going to get through the cross. He's giving you a picture of what grace looks like. Who gets it? The humble. Mm -hmm. The proud Pharisees left. They didn't get any, no condemnation. They left guilty because of the law. Right? right Jesus right. said, which one of you is without sin? Well, what shows them their sin? The law. Okay, so they left convicted by the law. Convicted by the law. They left. Because they're standing on the law. They want to stone her. He says, which of you has a right to stone her? Any of you have no sin? And they left convicted by what the law says your sin is. 
That's how we're yeah. supposed to use the law toward unbelievers. We're supposed to use it to... So that yeah, that's what the law is good savior. for, to show you you're a sinner. And that you need Jesus. You, know? you, need, uh, you need a Savior. You're not going to get into heaven on your good deeds. You're not good. Yeah, no matter right? how, how close you follow. No matter how well you think you're doing. You're, you're not getting, getting in. That's good. Yeah. So that, that's the point here. But, but you've got to look at this in light of the, script, of, of the new covenant because Jesus hasn't gone on the cross yet, but he will. So what is he doing for this woman? He's given her somehow an advance payment on what he can do, what he's going to do for her. But he can do it for her because she's been humbled. She's been humiliated, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, read it. It says she was thrown down in front of them. In front of the religious Verse leaders. 3, look at 8, verse 3. It says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman to him, a woman caught in the act of adultery, okay, and when they had set her in the midst. You know what that means? They took this woman, caught in the act of adultery, and threw her down in the middle of it. So it says right before that he was preaching. Right? It's like something taking someone to church. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's look at verse 2. Yeah. It says, and early in verse 2, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. Jesus comes to the temple. And all the people came to him. There's a bunch of people all around him. Yeah. Now, the Pharisees don't like that because they're, 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 when they come into him, they're turning from them. He's drawing all the people away from them, and they're and he's making what he's saying is kind of making them look bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really making them. They're all bad. It's just you know when they're standing next to him, they look bad. He's not making them look bad. They just do. They're just, they're bad. He's just exposing them. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So he's teaching. This is a sermon. Jesus is preaching a sermon. And it's the verse, next verse says that then the scribes and these Pharisees, the leaders, that, when it talks about scribes and Pharisees, it's talking about the leaders of the people, the rulers, the teachers of the law, you know, all these. They, and they come, the, the, the members of the, the Sanhedrin, right? That's yeah. the, the Pharisees, right? Right, yeah. right? yeah, the leaders of the Yeah, nation. leaders of the people. So, yeah. And they bring this woman caught in the act of adultery and throw her down the midst. Now, I don't know about you, but that'd be pretty humiliating, right? It's like taking something Right, in you're caught in the act of your yeah. sin. If, if we caught you in the act of some sin that's pretty bad, and okay, and we bring you church. into the church and we throw you down in front of the whole church and say, what? This guy was caught in the act. What do you, what do you guys think we should do to, yeah. what do you think we should do to Carlos? Kind of humiliating, right? Yeah. Well, the humiliation is the worst tort, tort of humility, right? It's the worst. I mean, because it's one thing to humble myself and say, you know what, it's wrong. I better, I need to go apologize. I'm going to humble myself and go apologize for what I did. Yeah. Okay, I humbled myself. Right. But when I, somebody has to humble me, it's a form of humiliation. It's the worst type of hu humility. Well, that's what's going on with this woman. So she was already humbled before yeah. everybody. Yeah. Embarrassed, ashamed, and expecting to be stoned. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm giving you a picture of what's going on here. That's good. That's so good. you understand why Jesus was able to minister grace to her. Because the Bible says in James, it says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So he gave those religious leaders who wanted to stone her, that's pride, thinking that you deserve stoning, but they don't. Right? That's, yeah. that, that's pride. Right? Thinking that you're the bad guy and we're not bad, we're good. Right? That's pride. So he gave them law to expose their junk. Right? Which gave is law is in opposition to your pride. It tells you you're not good. So that's the law is in opposition to those who are, it's so God opposes the proud, the law, he uses the law to do it, oh, right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. 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 it's, it's a ministry of condemnation, it's meant yeah. to condemn you. The Bible says it's a ministry of condemnation, the law kills. It exposed, the Bible, uh, Romans 3.19 says the law was given to silence you and show you your guilt. It exposes you. So he used the law to expose them, showing them under the law, none of you are innocent. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you're just But deceived. then he turned to her and he gave her the humble, the humiliated grace. So that was a picture of who gets it. That's good. That's really good. Isn't breakdown. it good? That's a good breakdown. Yeah, because, you know, it's uh, <laughs> that the, um, the God in his mercy showed Excuse them the me. law so they could see their need for the Savior. So that, he could, that they would wake up. Yeah, know, it was a tutor to point you to yeah. the law. The law was just a tutor to bring you to Christ. Yeah, so maybe, it was like a substitute teacher. Yeah, that's what it means by a tutor. Yeah, yeah. It was like a substitute teacher teaching you until the real teacher shows up. Grace, Jesus, grace is a real teacher. Grace is a real teacher. The it Bible says grace to, teaches, teaches us to, to say no to ungodliness, ungodliness yeah. and worldly passions, and, and, and live self-controlled lives, and to live self-controlled godly lives. That's what grace is a that's teacher. teacher is actual that teacher. he brings us to, into grace, bringing us to Jesus, who's our Savior, teacher. who saves us through grace. We're saved by grace through faith. So we're coming to now that was just law was just a tutor to bring us to Jesus who is now saving us by grace grace and truth came by Jesus Christ the law came by Moses yeah. wow yeah. wow yeah. okay so th this is what I want you to see 
So um, when Jesus, okay, verse 10, when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman there, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Okay, mm -hmm. now here's the thing. Those who would have stoned her couldn't. Jesus made them leave. And the only one who had no sin, who could stone her, he was God in the flesh. He's the judge. Uh -huh. Jesus said that the, the father judges no one, but he's given all judgment to the son. Right? right so right. the only one who had a right to judge her, it says that, right? Yeah, the, the, right all yeah. judgment has been given to the son. He chose to be judged for you. He chose to take your judgment to the cross. So he's the judge. He's the only one who has a right to judge her. One lawgiver right? can save her. The, so the ones who would have couldn't, and the one who could have wouldn't. Wow. Who? There's only one lawgiver. She yeah. said, he says, so where's your, who has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. What would you say, Dylan? There's only one lawgiver who can save or destroy, and it's Jesus. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Go See? Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Verse 11, he says, so there's no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus says to her, neither do I. If they can't condemn you, if they don't have a right to condemn you, well, I'm the one who has a right to condemn you, and I don't either. Right? That's what he's saying. Yeah. If they can't condemn you, well, don't look to me for condemnation. Okay? Right. If nobody else has a right to condemn you, Carlos, nobody does because we're all guilty of sin. James said, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. No one has a right to condemn you. And Jesus is right here telling you, just like the woman caught in the act of adultery, okay, if nobody else has a right to condemn you, don't ever look at me as if I am. Because I don't condemn you either. So that means there's nobody in the universe. Are, are you feeling me? Yeah. That's pretty heavy. The devil who tried to condemn you is the word guilty of one of most guilty of all. And, and then if you go into the new covenant, it confirms that. It says, who will condemn you? Christ? No. He's the one who died for you. And is up. And now he's even interceding for you. Oh, wow. Well, that's good. No that's condemnation. Wonderful. So don't look to him for condemnation. Don't look to him for that. Don't look at that. Don't ever put that on Jesus. People just butter this up and say, well, he, the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. Is he? Why would Jesus, having no condemnation, telling this woman, I don't condemn you, go sin no more, setting her free, what the Bible says we get, yeah. liberty, freedom. Yeah. We're supposed to be under a law of freedom. That's what we get, what he did with her, set her free, right? Did tell her, go sin no more, but he gave her no condemnation first. It's the Spirit of Christ. Right? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Yeah. It's a, another one, it's a paraclete. It's a, another one like Jesus, the Holy Spirit. is. A... Where was I going with that? I'm I was sorry. just going to say oh, something. I'm sorry. Yeah. Where are those who accuses of yours? Does no one condemn you? Oh, yeah. Um, so he said. Romans 8. Yeah. So he says that I, he's now interceding for you. He's, he's not only. He's not, it's a, the Holy Spirit conviction. People oh, say, yeah. okay, listen, off the bat. They all do the same thing. Jesus is not there saying, hey, I don't condemn you. No condemnation. Man, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness. I'm not imputing sin. God was in Christ, not imputing his sin. He's not even imputing your sin. He's not remembering your sin. He's being merciful to your unrighteousness. Okay, he's no condemnation. He's interceding for you. But the Holy Spirit is here convicting you. See, no condemnation here, but the Holy Spirit does condemn. And that goes against what Conviction says. means condemn. I mean, if you go look up the words, they both mean the same thing. They're just making it, you know, they, they yeah. use that word to say something different. And the only reason they're doing that is because there's a scripture in the Bible that says uh, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Convicts the world of sin. Yeah, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. But Jesus goes on to say that's the only place in the Bible where it says the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit does for me. Okay, let me show you. Okay. okay. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. Now, the Bible says don't grieve, grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. Don't grieve him. So... If, 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 if you're not grieved by some sin in your life, something like that, confessing it doesn't fix it. You can confess it all day long. It doesn't fix the problem. So if you really want to deal with that problem, whatever your sin you're struggling with, talk to God about the problem. Okay? Lord, why am I not, I'm not grieved in my spirit the way that you are? Why is there a disconnect? Father, help me to be grieved the same way you are but in my spirit from this, this thing that's probably... See, it's a more of an opening, an open door to discuss rather than just feeling dirty and convicted and feeling like distant from God because after all, the Holy Spirit's my enemy had convicting me. This is what I like to tell people. It's very simple. Real simple. Let me help you. How do I tell the difference between the devil accusing me? The Bible says Satan is the accuser of the brethren. How do I tell the difference between the Satan accusing me and, G and, and, and the Holy Spirit convicting me? How do I tell the difference? 
Well, some people might say, well, this one is to help you, you, to you know, bless you. you. Well, how does Satan not disguise it? The Bible says he appears as an angel of light. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. How do I know that's not Satan doing that? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm just blessing you here. I'm, I'm accusing you of sin. See that thing you did, you dirty person? That's bad. You're so bad. You know, how do you know? How do you know? Some people can get real, real fancy. They say conviction and condemnation. Conviction draws you to God and condemnation draws you away from God. That's how you can tell. The well, that's not how it's preached because for years yeah. I heard that my Holy Spirit's convicting me and it actually put distance between me and God. Yeah, that's so, what that yeah, does. That's what it does. That's I, unless you were to really explain it. Like, yeah. I mean, if that's where they go to, out of their way to explain that, you might be able to help somebody. Yeah, but, but nobody does. Nobody goes that far. Yeah. Nobody goes and explains what that conviction of the Holy Spirit should actually be. They don't go and tell you. Well, if you're going to feel by, what I would say, if I'm going to say, if you're going to feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, you better hear the Romans 8, 15, that says that the Holy Spirit confirms within your spirit that you're a child of God. He always does that. Okay, so if you're getting convicted by the Holy Spirit about something wrong you did and you're just feeling dirty and distant from God, dude, you're going to the wrong place because you should also hear the Holy Spirit over here saying, hey, you know what? You're still a child of God. He's always doing that. The Bible says he does that. It's clear that he does that. This idea of Holy Spirit conviction, that it convicts you of all sins, that's not clear. He actually says that he convicts the sin. He said where he says the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. He says of the sin of unbelief. It's unbelief. You're not trusting in Jesus. Right? right, right that's what right. it says. And that's the only place that it says Holy Spirit conviction. That's why we got to go That's the only the place. Word. That's why go you got to go with the word and see what the word says. Yeah, not with tradition. Yeah, man. what tradition's handed down. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins, makes you feel it bad. Like you, know, and, you know, off the bat, anytime you're sinning, okay, it should draw you to God, never away from him. Good okay, so if this Holy... Okay, if you want to use Holy Spirit conviction... Fine, but it should be drawing you to him, closer, not further. Okay? So, so off the bat, me, I don't like the word conviction because it's conviction, I, I used to be a convict. I know how that feels like to wear the label convicted. Okay? It means you're guilty. How in the world is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Conviction means you're guilty. Right? How in the world is the Holy Spirit convicting you? And the Bible says that he, God is justifying the ungodly. You know what justification is? Declaring you not guilty. So it sounds like a, it sounds like a right? proposed two So is the Holy Spirit's convicted me, but God isn't. The Holy Spirit's convicted me of sin, but God is justifying the ungodly, declaring you not guilty. Which is it? It's almost like, see, it keeps you, it, it keeps you distant. It keeps you in a place of, of huh? What? Yeah, that's where you're constantly in a Bible study, constantly needing to be taught when you, instead of getting up like me, getting up and teaching. Because I'm trying to help you see what the Bible actually says. So I feel my spirit being lifted right now. I yeah. feel the uh, heaviness being lifted off of me just by hearing the truth. Isn't it? It's, it's true. It is I was true. was in a funk, you know, and now it's lifted. You know? Isn't that great? It's, it's great. Thank so, you. Thank you. I just wanted to share that testimony with you. And that's just one. Yeah. And he says, so she yeah, says, no, no. He says, who has condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go sin no more. Now notice he gave her no condemnation. He didn't say, if you stop your sinning, I won't condemn you. Have you forgiven everybody? Because I can't, con I, 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 if you're not forgiving everybody, then you're condemned. I mean, you, I can't forgive you because you got to forgive to be forgiven. Isn't that what he said elsewhere? He said that elsewhere. Didn't he say that in Sermon on the Mount? If you don't forgive, you're not forgiving? Well, he didn't even deal with that here. Mm -hmm. He just, bam, no condemnation, period. And she was caught in the act of adultery. We think if we're caught in the act of unforgiveness, he won't forgive me. She's caught in the act of adultery. And he's given her no condemnation. See, something's not fitting the picture of what, you know, obviously Jesus is saying one thing here and saying another thing here, only because here he's ministering grace. Mm -hmm. Over there, when he said, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven, he's ministering law. Right. Uh, ah! Yeah, yeah. He had two ministries. He had, one was prophetic, something you're going to get in the future, and here he's just giving a down payment on what's coming. He's just giving you a picture of who gets it, grace people. I mean, who gets grace is humble, the humble get it. This woman thought she was going to be stoned. She was busted. It's like that tax collector who said, have mercy on me, a sinner. He, was, had nothing, he didn't have a prayer. That's humility. We come to God not having a prayer. Like I said earlier, we don't come to give. We come to receive. Yeah. We don't come to be rescued. We come to get a resurrection. We need new life. Because the life we have is an Adamic nature. That's the that's Adamic life. That's the, we come into this world just sinners. 
you know, we need a whole new life. We need spiritual life. He says, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Let me help you understand what is, what is the flesh. Okay. Okay, what is the flesh? The flesh is that old man that you used to be, the old Adamic nature, that, the, how you used to think in the old way. And the flesh today, and if a believer, would be just the way I used to think, that old thinking, the devil stirs that up, and now I'm getting in the flesh again. Or worldly but that, but thinking. you aren't, yeah. Worldly programming. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what the damage done, and, and you, have, you tending to go there again. That would be thinking in the flesh. But you're not the flesh. What the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, he, uh, it says to put off that old man which is corrupt and put on the new man which is created righteous and truly holy after God in righteousness and true holiness put that new man on. So that old man is the flesh. That's not you anymore. You used to live there, you used to think that way, you used to be connected to the flesh. A sinner. Love and sin. But you don't love sin anymore. You love God. You're, you're serving, you used to serve sin. Now you serve righteousness, right? Right. You're not yeah. comfortable around people that are uh, doing drugs and doing, you know. Yeah, you're not comfortable stuff. around that stuff anymore. You're not comfortable yeah, around profanities. Swearing, you don't swearing, like profanities yeah. bother you. I don't like hearing swearing. I don't like watching pornography. That stuff, I, I, there was a time maybe I was okay with that, but definitely not now. Something changed. Right. And it's coming from the heart. It's just a new person that you are. You're a new man. And he says, all that old man, put that off. That ain't you no more. That's the flesh. That's flesh thinking. That's not you. So don't identify yourself with the flesh. The flesh is an enemy of the Christian. It's the old man. Right? Does that make sense? Right. Because we used to think outside of the five... We used to just think... Now we think outside of the five senses. We, the Bible says that we live by faith and not by sight. We used to live inside the five senses. If I see it, I believe it. I got to hear it. I got to, you know, it's, you know, what I touch, smell, taste. I'm just living from my five senses. What's appealing to the eye? The Bible talks about what's appealing to the eye. You know, you know, food, if it tastes good, I'll eat it. You know, I'll just, I'll eat, you know, eat it, we're just living there from the five senses. But when you became a Christian, you live outside of those five senses. You now look at a spiritual realm, a God who you can't see. Right? Right, faith. A devil yeah. who you can't see. You believe in a heaven that you can't see. It's outside of your five senses. Now we're living outside of our fences, five senses. We didn't used to do that. Right? Uh, you see that? So something really happened. Something huge happened. You're a spiritual man now. And God is dealing with you who you are in the spirit. Isn't that great? Yeah, we have an eternal perspective now. You, yeah, yeah, you have an eternal perspective. You believe you know, in a heaven and a hell. You, you, believe, yeah, you, don't just you as a believer, you, you believe whatever. you're not... Carlos, do you believe you're not going to hell? You, you're absolutely right. Because right. I know what saved me from it. Uh -huh. I, I have a savior. I have a savior. I, I'm, saved. I'm saved. And the Bible says we're saved to the uttermost. Completely, 100%. Right, right, right. The Bible says your citizenship is in heaven. He, yeah, John says, John says in First John, he says, I write this so you can know you have eternal life. You can know it. He wants you to know it. Wow. Not hope and, you know, am I going to be good enough? Well, you, you weren't good enough to be saved. If God saves so you're not going to be good enough yeah. to be saved when it comes to heaven either. You weren't, good, you weren't good enough for salvation. I mean, that's why Jesus had to go and die for your sins because nobody's good enough. So he came and was good enough for you. That's what he means. That he yeah. came to fulfill the law. He was good enough for you. Right? If God saved you when you were at your worst and, and you're dead in sin, how much more is he going to save you now that you're his child? You know? Yeah, that's what it says in Romans. Yeah. He says, if he died for you when you were sinners, how much more he'll do for you now that you've been reconciled, now that you're his friend? More, not less. People think you'll do less now that you're a Christian. They say you're... They think now you've got to walk on eggshells. Now you better be able to step up to the plate and hit some home runs. Now that you're on his team, you better do it. No, it's not. I want to do it. It's, a, it's not you better. Rest. It's not you have to. It's not a threat of punishment because Jesus was punished for me. There's no threat of punishment. There's not threatening a curse. Jesus became a curse for you. There's no dealing with your sin because Jesus became sin for you. Uh, this is all scripture. We're called to a rest. Yeah. yeah he rest. says, come unto me, I'll give you rest. He's call, inviting you into a rest in him. Yeah, not a right? not labor. Yeah. He, says, uh, he says, you'll find rest for your souls. He wants you to just rest in Christ. 
Just enjoy your new life. What if God just wants to do, God is just doing you a favor. Carlos, you need a favor, right? Okay, let's say uh, you're worried about your rent. You're not gonna be able to pay your rent this month. If something, you just, if something some miracle doesn't take place, you're gonna be on the streets, what happened to you me? know, yeah. right? That's what happened to me. And so, so miracle, I need a miracle, man. I don't know what's gonna happen here. I can't pay my rent, what's gonna happen? And then all of a sudden here comes Dylan. Dylan steps in and says, don't worry about it, Carlos, I got your back, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> don't worry. It's all good, man. Don't you, you don't, you go sleep good tonight. You don't worry. That's a rest. Yeah. Go sleep yeah. good. Don't worry. Jesus said, don't worry. You'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this world, you'll have many troubles. He says, don't worry. I've overcome the world. He says, right? And how does he say it? He says, in, in the world, you'll have tribulation. But what do you say about just, peace? He says, peace. I give my peace, peace unto you. you. I give my peace to you. He says, I give my peace, my peace I give unto you. Not as yeah. the world gives, because in this world, you're going to have trouble. He says, but don't worry, I've overcome the world. You have good cheer. You see, so he's giving you his peas. Right. He says, come to me for rest. So like I said, Dylan, he paid you rent. Now you're, you're okay. You don't have to sweat it. You're not worried because he just stepped in and did that. Well, that's what he did you a favor. It doesn't have to be because you're such a great guy. He just saw a need and he met it. Right? Right, right. No, right, because, he, because of his heart. It's not because of yours, because you're such a great guy. You might have hurt him, his feelings this week. It doesn't matter. It's just he's got a big heart and he wants to help you. He sees a need and he wants to meet it. He wants to do you a favor. He wants to help you. That's God. Because of his big heart. Yeah. He, Jesus God. dying on a cross, his right. heart. Right. Because the heart of Jesus, the heart of God, and it's the heart of the Holy Spirit. Same. They all think alike. Don't ever attribute something to the Holy Spirit that God isn't doing. Right, of course. Uh, okay. Yeah. So because of his big heart, he just wants to, did you like Dylan's big heart, he wants to pay your rent and save you all that, that sweating. God wants to do a big, don't, he just wants to do you a favor. And he says, can you believe I'm doing it? He says, you can believe that he justifies the ungodly. Do you need to go to the bathroom? And say, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Carlos. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till he yeah. gets back and then I'll go. Yeah, but I want to uh, get back to the rest. Are, are you feeling me? I'm feeling you. This is, this is heavy. This is important I can't wait to hear this when yeah, I'm we, the recording because yeah. I'm covering some ground here. I'm covering here. a lot of good ground about the Holy Spirit. You know, but, the but, ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's a, I'm not even really looking at notes. I'm just, yeah, this just is just my heart. I'm just speaking my heart of the yeah. God I've come to know. Right, right. And, and I'm throwing scriptures in there to support it. That's a good title, the God you come to know. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thanks. The God you come to know. But this is, I don't this is know. You this, know. Is the, this is the foundation, though. We have to, it says we've got to boast in who God, who we, God we know the God to be. And most people don't see him this way. Because I think it's a real disservice to not letting people that have been through prison, ex-drug addicts, convicts, you know, who have a testimony, to let them get up there and share their view of God, how they come to know God. I think that's a real disservice because we don't get enough of that. People, people don't know God the way that people that have been the woman caught in the act of adultery, man. She got to how know did God. she get to know? She got to know a God in, in a, a very unique, special way. In a very unique way. Right? Yeah. So did Mary Magdalene. They yeah, got Mary seven, Magdalene. They got seven demons cast out. Seven demons cast out. The woman who, uh, I think it was Mary, anointed his feet. Yeah, right? yeah it was yeah. Mary who did that. One, yeah. There was two different scenarios. Yeah. One was Mary. Right. Two different women anointed Jesus, right? Right, There's Two yeah. different scenarios. And they gave all they could, yeah, all they had. Yeah. I know that's true because there's two different scenarios in yeah. one gospel. Right, it's it's two, not like, yeah, yeah there's two. There's one one right of the gospels, there's minutes, two different the scenarios. The and one right before he went to the cross. Yeah, so there's yeah. two situations yeah. where, yeah. yeah, and those, both of them, it's just. One was a sinful woman and the other one was one of the disciples. That's a good point yeah. because Mary was, a, was someone who had seven, like me, had seven yeah. demons yeah. cast out of her and she was the first one to the two, she was the first one she, at the resurrection. She, she, the first one, uh, she was the first, uh, to, she to, was the, to, to the first, the, body, the, point the, the body. first, the last one at the cross and, and the, the first, first one at the one tomb. The, the first one at the tomb. Right? Is right. that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. She was the first one at the cross. Last one at the cross. Oh, last one at the cross and the, the first, first one, one at the, the tomb. tomb. for resurrection. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Just because she got to know him. Right, right. It's very unique. Oh my gosh. It's good. That's good, huh? That's really good. That's really good because, yeah, that's what... That's what but that's, that's Mary and that's me. I mean, yeah. that's me. I mean, I have my demons cast out of me. You know, seriously. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, do I still struggle with some demonic stuff? You know, Paul did. He said he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan. Paul even struggled with demons after his salvation. We all do. Yeah, we all do. You yeah, know, be you may take some of those demons to the grave. They ain't yeah. going to you with you to heaven. No, they're not. They might go with you to the grave, but they ain't going to heaven. Yeah. They've been kicked out of heaven. Right, right. That's they good. got no Thank place God in heaven, that. man. But they, they might mess that. with you here.
they're and not they're not possessing you. They don't own you. They don't. They, they, they can't take ownership of you. God says that you've been bought for price, and you're no longer your own. He says he's, 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 he owns you. God takes ownership. That means this, the demons cannot take possession of a child of God. Okay, but they can't oppress you. They can't come at you, throw everything they got at you. You know, but there's even that's limited. God limits their ability to do whatever they do. Or they, you'd be a mess. If, the, if God just let him go yeah, just have that, beat you up. You know, yeah. it, you up a so good example is Job. When God let Satan do what he did, he put limits on everything he could do. So you'd still mess he him said, up you can him. mess with him, but not, yeah. not more than this. He said, you can, you can mess with him, but you can't uh, mess with his body. Then the second time he says, okay, well, you can attack his body, but you can't kill him. He put restrictions on the devil, oh, on yeah. what he could do. Yeah. You see that? And God so always know will, that, yeah. that God is still sovereign. He says he, he will give us no temptation, you know, that we can't handle. Yeah, know? he won't give yeah. you no temptation that you can't. So he won't yeah. let the devil over, you know, whelm us. Isn't that good? Yeah. I only got through the first one. Look at wow. all these I had. I only got through the first one. Well, we still okay. have time. We still have time. So uh, let's look at, okay, let's look at, um, let's look at Galatians uh, 5, 1 and 5, 13. Now I'm going to read what from the NIV. I like the way the NIV says okay. this. All right. Okay. Really? No, did I say 5, 1? You said 5, 1 and 5, 13. Yeah, Galatians 5, 1, yeah. Yeah. Galatians 5 1. According to you MIT, ready? Bible Gateway. Okay, Galatians I'm going to read from the NIV five. because. Um, wait, that's not it. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Hold on. Here oh, it is. Yeah. Okay, it's a new living. New living translation. Because look, I'm going to read from it. says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Right? Right. It's for, we're set Stand free. firm. Then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Okay? But I like the, NI, the New Living Translation. Look at this. Because you wonder what slavery is he talking about. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay, go ahead. So this is the New Living Translation. So Christ has truly set you free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again to the slavery to the law. Oh, it's that's what clear. Talking about, about the law. Yeah. It's talking about the law. Don't go back under law thinking, law language. Don't go there. Oh, and what yeah. Jesus was, Jesus was using a lot of law language. And that steals your freedom. If you think you have to forgive to be forgiven. That's if you good. think you've got to be merciful to be, yeah. for God to receive God's mercy. That's law language. You're putting yourself under slavery to the law again. See? And Jesus said that stuff. And that's why people get confused. Because Jesus said it. But he was living under law. The law it says that uh, Jesus was getting, let me see. You know, where is this verse that it says that uh, he, he was born under law? Yeah, that's in 5, that's isn't it? Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Go back to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to show you something. It's 4-4. Um, it's four, four, four. Good. Let's go. go Galatians 4-4. Four, four. Okay. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. Do you see that? Yes. That means that what Jesus, what Jesus, he couldn't come and just minister grace, you know, and say, don't worry, uh, God has forgiven you. You're, you're cleansed of all unrighteousness. You're not, God's not imputing your sin. He couldn't just say that. You know why he couldn't say that? Because he ain't gone to the cross yet and paid for that. Right, right. Right? Yeah. So he couldn't minister grace the way that Paul can in the New Testament. Well, when he did Paul's a minister of grace. Yeah. He, when he ministered, right? Jesus ministered grace in the book of John, people rejected him. They, they were ready to throw him off the cliff and everything and all kinds of crazy things. Going on. Read on. Go ahead. Born of a woman, born, of the, born under law. Look at this. This tells you where the drawing line is between law and grace. This is the best scripture I can use to, to support this clash of the covenants. Oh, wow, wow. That's right? Okay, yeah. This is it. This okay. is the, I preach a lot on the clash of the covenants. That much of what Jesus said was, was, was law language, and much of what Jesus said was, was prophetic of something that was coming after the cross. This right here clearly says that he was born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law. Okay? That mm -hmm. we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, let me ask you, where did that redemption take place? At the cross. At the cross. Yeah. 
So that means that the whole time he was walking, he was born under law. That means the whole time until he went to the cross, he was still living under law and still dealing with people according to the law. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Carlos? Yeah. I mean, I mean that, this is important. This is so important because this is where people get it wrong. Yeah. People take what Jesus says and they apply it to Christians. Everything he said. I'm a red letter Christian. Red letters is everything that Jesus said. Red letters. Everything that is in red letters. And if you have a red letter Bible, like I think this one is. Yeah. I think yeah. See red letter Bible. Yeah, yeah it's red letter Bible. No. Everything you see that is in red letters, that's Jesus speaking. That's why then it's, it says here. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, all of a sudden it's red letters. Yeah, I got a red letter You see, Bible. because yeah. he said it. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and people say, oh, I'm a red letter Christian. If Jesus said it, I do it. Oh. Yeah, well, yeah, do you right. cut off your arms? Do you pluck out your eye? You know, he said it. You know, are you fearing hell because you, call, you thought somebody's a fool or an idiot? Are, are you going to fear hell now as a, as a Christian? Are you gonna give Jesus said it. Are you going to give your, your are, are you going to fear judgment because you got angry today? Are you fearing judgment from God because of that? Are you going to do that? Jesus said it. You're a red-letter Christian. He said it. You do it. Well, that means you've got to fear judgment. You've got to fear hell. That means you've got to consider t cutting off your arms, plucking out your eyes. That means you've got to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He told, told that one guy to do that, too. Yeah, and he also said that if someone sues you, you give them that and more. Yeah. You don't get a lawyer. Yeah, he said to sell it. It's, yeah, he said... Uh, he, he said, he said that if you, you, you're going to be condemned by every word you speak. He says, by every word you speak, you shall be condemned. You want to live like that? No. It's very, very... Self-condemnation, when the Bible says there's no condemnation for you in Christ. Why would I live under condemnation, worried about every word that I speak? Jesus said it. He said, by every word you shall be condemned. You want to see it? Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah. Go, to, go to Matthew chapter 12. Oh, my God. This is important. You really want to live yeah. like this, Mr. Red Letter Christian? This is terrible. It's not good news. Verse 36. 12, 36. Matthew 12, 36. This is red letters. Yeah. But I say to you that for every idle word, you know what that means by idle? Every careless word. Oh. You just Careless with your words. Oh, thank you. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that right, Dylan? Idle? Yeah, idle. Yeah. Just it's, careless. It's, it's, it's empty words. Yeah, just, just, you know. Just like foolish. You know, that means anytime I'm sarcastic, just kidding around, messing yeah. with people, I'm accountable to God. He's going to get me. You have to answer. Dude, because I, I play around. I'm sarcastic sometimes. I do that. Yeah. Right? That's considered an idle word. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Foolish talk. Yeah. Foolish talk. That by every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Outside of Christ, that's it. That's oh, my gosh. Oh. Outside by, of Jesus. By yeah. every idle word you speak, you will give an account in the day of judgment. Is that, a, you're Mr. Red Letter Christian, I guess you live by that, fear of judgment? Why would you want to live that way when the Bible says those who believe on him, you will never be judged? Right? Right. He says, by, he says, all those who believe on him will never have already passed from death into life and you will never come into judgment. So he's saying this here, but he also says over here that by every idle word, you will be judged. Which is it? Jesus is saying two things here. See, they don't mix, do they? No, they don't. You will never be judged, right, for believing on him, or you're going to be judged by every word you speak. Right. They don't mix. In verse 37, for by your words, you will be justified and your words, you will be condemned. Now, right there, look at that. You know what the Bible says about justified? He says, if you believe that God's justifying the ungodly. Your word is not going to be the what justifies you. It's Jesus. It's God's going to justify you. Yeah. Ungodly as you are, he's yeah. going to justify you. So there's your justification. It's not by your words. Unless it's you by, it's by the blood of Jesus. Unless you have perfect performance. It's your faith in the blood. There's your justification. If you have perfect performance, then you... Then that Go read Romans chapter 3. It says that Jesus is the just and the justifier. Of them that believe in right? you. Right? Yeah. And that he's justifying us. 
So there's your justification. And when he says, by your words, you will be condemned, we, we know that there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Right. These you see are for, that? These so are got, for those outside of Christ. You've got to read the, that the through the eyes, understanding that law. Jesus was born under law and he's still living under law. Therefore, he, he can't just totally preach, you know, saved by the blood because his blood hadn't been shed yet. This is pure law talk. It is. Yeah, because this is, this is no grace in there whatsoever. It is. It's, but law, I, it's, not, it's no mixture either. But at the same yeah. time, Jesus would at times prophesy about what you're going to get through faith in him. Right, right. That's why, like I tell people, Matthew is a lot of scary stuff if you don't take it with the Gospel of John. you got to read them together because in John, he just nails it. You just, hey, you just receive Jesus. You have the right to be called. He says that right at the very beginning of John. He yeah. says, just receive him, and he gives you the right to be a child of God. Jesus never preached mixture, you know, mixing law and grace. Jesus never mixed law and grace. He either preached pure law or pure grace. That's a good point. That's a good point. He, he never, did. A lot of people preach mixture. Yeah, that's why in Sermon on the Mount, where he's preaching a lot of law stuff, he never mentions believe on him. It's either pure law yeah. or pure grace. He never mixes. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew pure. 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, he never mentions believing on him. Because it, it's mainly, it's, it, it, there's, there's stuff in there alludes to him, right? Right. It alludes to him, but he never comes right out and says, hey, just trust in me. Right? Yeah. People but in John, he yeah. just nails, just trust in me, just believe yeah. on me, just believe on Jesus. You won't be condemned. Believe on me. He'll raise you from the, he, 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 he'll raise you in the last day. Just believe on him. And, and that's the only work you got to do. What works do we need to do? Just believe on him. He just tells you believe on him. He says, just believe on him and you won't be condemned. He says, believe on him. You won't perish, but have eternal life. John, that's all in John. Just wow. nailing, just trusting in him. Mm -hmm. But Matthew kind of goes all over the board with this thing. Talking about, you know, some law language, but that's mainly because it's written to Matthew. It's written to the Jews. He's dealing with Jews living under the law. You'll get that language in John. Yeah. Yeah. It's just in Matthew, right? Matthew. Well, and, we're done. In the synoptic. Yeah. We guess we're going to pray. We're going to pray us out. Yeah. Go ahead and pray us out. We'll, um, okay. Yeah. We got to finish. That's it. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Father God, thank you so much for uh, God that you, you, you're, you're the God of all grace, the God of all comfort. And we come to know you, God, and we just thank you, Father, for that we, we have eternal life in you. We have eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. And God, we just great we just give you the praise, God. We thank you that you are our shepherd and our protector. And bless this uh service and bless Carlos as he goes to see Jack. In your holy name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. All right, thank you, Carlos.